we have we have at least started. <laughs> I think that the, the the challenge there is where do you actually start and where do you actually yeah, end? I mean, there's some predictions around when it will start to have an effect. Um, 2025, for example, is a is a is a time in the calendar where people are uh, expecting that ship owners will have to start uh, reporting uh, the climate impact of their fuel use on their fleet. Um, around that time. The shipping industry is taking its first steps to dramatically decarbonise itself. For most, this is a move beyond using traditional marine bunker fuels more efficiently to using completely different fuels, ones that either emit zero greenhouse gas emissions when used as a fuel, such as hydrogen or ammonia, or what are being labelled as net zero fuels because they actually do use CO2 and it comes out of the funnel when you're burned in the engine. That can be synthetic LNG, synthetic methane, and of course synthetic methanol, and then there are the biofuels as well. This is important because cargo owners and other stakeholders increasingly want to know the environmental costs of their transport chain. They want to make the comparisons and take action when and where they can. Why is this important? How is this focus on performing a life cycle assessment going to play a role in the transport, shipping and logistics chains? And importantly, when and who is it going to impact? Will there be winners and losers and can you afford not to know how sustainability and life cycle questions just got serious. I'm Craig Eason, podcast producer and owner of the Fathom World website, which focuses on the transformation of the shipping maritime and ocean worlds. And welcome to a special series of the Aronex podcast, supported by Reflow in Denmark. Experts on helping companies, from ship owners to manufacturers, collect and analyze the data that they need to assess product and business life cycles, and how this data can then be used by them and their clients to determine environmental aspects associated with the products over their use from their creation to end of life. To help me uncover more about the growing importance and influence of LCAs, that's life cycle assessments, in the industry, and to explain what it means is Rasmus Ellsborg Jensen, EU Climate Pact Ambassador, a pioneer in all things circular, life cycle assessments, and also founder and CEO of Reflow. Hello, Craig. Uh, thanks you for the for the invite and taking the initiative to highlight the many possibilities life cycle assessment, or as you mentioned, LCA, uh, brings to the maritime industry. The maritime industry is undergoing a big transformation towards a greener future, um, and I believe there is a better there is a need to better understand the environmental impact of both the vessels and the systems that underlie the vessels. And as, as I say, um, if you can't measure it, you can't really change it. And that that's really the fundamentals behind the life cycle thinking. When I began this journey a few weeks ago to examine LCAs, I was, to say the least, probably, like most working professionals, a little bit daunted and sceptical. I'd, of course, heard of life cycle assessments. I'd heard of circular economies and sustainability and, of course, ESG reporting. But I tended to put them all into the same bag, meaning just being green and good and also being transparent about it. But there's, I'm getting the picture now, there's more to it. I mean, I've been hearing a lot from the shipping industry over the last decade about eco ships, super eco ships, green ships, and even about a pathway to decarbonize, even when the ships would still use hydrocarbon fuel. So, so what are we talking about when we're talking about LCAs? Well, I think it's very, very healthy to be somewhat skeptical on what's going on in the green transition right now, especially also in the maritime industry, because a lot of stuff is happening and greener vessels are being designed and launched as we speak. And the question is really, what is green? Is this better compared to something else? And for here, it's really important that we start becoming more uh, data-driven and granular in our understanding of what is green, what is environmentally friendly, and also the many labels that are out there um, that we see ship owners and vessel designers and shipyards are using um, to label their ships, as you mentioned, eco ships and green ships. I think it's super important that we um, that we make sure that that this is really based in in some kind of a data. And this is where life cycle assessment has its advantage because life cycle assessment is, as you mentioned, something about the life cycle of a product. And I think to to better explain life cycle assessment, um, I many times use an example from outside the maritime industry. 
Um, and this example is all about what we're using today. And an excellent example for this is the electrical cars versus, versus the fossil fuel cars. Um, we see, especially here in Denmark, when the electrical car start, uh, was started and rolled out, many of the taxi companies here uh, labeled them as zero emission taxis. Um, and there was a lot of fuss about in Denmark because the Danish authorities there were saying, well, is this really zero emission? And what they used to explain it and what they required the taxi company to document is using life cycle assessments methodology. And it's really saying, if you look at the um, entire life cycle of the electrical car versus the fossil fuel car, will you get a zero emission uh, out of it or are there differences? And what they came out with in that study was really that the electrical car is zero emission in its use phase, saying there is no emissions from the exhaust, just like the fossil fuel powered cars. Or yeah. And but what they could see is that the emissions are really being moved around in the life cycle of the two cars. So the the electrical cars will require um, batteries, uh, lithium ion batteries, and those are based on rare earth minerals. And it could be it doesn't emit anything in Denmark, but in the country where the batteries, uh, minerals are being mined and resources being extracted, it will release emissions to the atmosphere. And the same with the end of life scenarios for these lithium batteries will require uh, emissions to recycle the materials or probably for the landfill. So it is really a game about saying if we compare two solutions, the two life cycles of this solution or these vessels, is it really green? Is it better than what we do today? And life cycle assessment will give you this granularity. It will really uh, methodology, it will really zoom down to all the data sources so you know where do we have the most emissions of a car in this case or in a vessel and how is it linked up to everything we do from it being designed, the vessel, it's being manufactured, built, it's being maintained, it's being used, it's being life extended, it's being and so on. So all the life cycle steps will be accounted for and you will see your emissions. So if you start decarbonizing a vessel, you will also see if you are shifting the emissions and what to what extent. So it's all about being data driven in your decision making process. And that is why I see life cycle assessment as a perfect fit for the maritime decarbonization efforts going on right now. In this series, I've called on sustainability and LCA experts from a range of different businesses to help me untangle what this all means, whether it's greenwashing, to look at those life cycle stages that you're talking about there, Rasmus, and to understand where one needs to go to measure the emissions. So with you as my guide, I've spoken to financial experts from banks, to a ship owner, to a manufacturer of cosmetics, about the consumer market, a maritime equipment supplier, an expert looking at marine fuels, as well as a researcher specifically examining life cycle and the well-to-wake picture of those future marine fuels, as well as talking to a sustainability expert in a shipbuilder to look right at the beginning. How do we look at the life cycle of a ship even before it's built? On the one hand, like internally, we have to um, make sure the whole principle of thinking about the life cycle, we should include that, but indeed also the parties that we're working with and the clients. There are a few clients that are really proactively asking. We are already aware that uh, some of the material categories we are utilizing are those having a relatively high CO2 footprint. This is super exciting, Craig, and I'm looking so much forward to these many angles we're going to get on something as complex or it could be complex as life cycle assessment. Um, and I'm looking very much forward to um, to see how it's being used and how it can be used and, and give everybody a good understanding of the possibilities that it holds. So join Rasmus and myself as we start our journey to unravel how life cycle assessments of fuels, ships and cargoes are entwined and all influence each other and how they can be understood, explained and measured and likely reported and used to create measurable change. So go to your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the Aronex podcast or subscribe to the Fathom.world newsletter by going to Fathom World and signing up or follow Fathom World and Reflow. You'll find us on LinkedIn.